There's something that's got your um, oh, that yeah, got your tight, dander tight. up, isn't it, James? Well, also because about eight people have sent it to me. What do you think of this, then, <laughs> James? Eh? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so, so, this this has annoyed me on two levels. Um, right, so what's okay. happened is Anthony Beaver has had his book on Arnhem finally published in the US because the USC, yeah. I presumably see. Market Garden is a predominantly American, uh, British effort, oh, um, yeah, completely yeah. obviously forgetting the crucial role played by one particular general in their <laughs> airborne division. Um, <laughs> and, um, the independent company know who we're talking about. We know who we're talking about. <laughs> um, um, anyway, um, uh, so anyway, for whatever reason, it's finally coming out in, in, in the US. And Anthony's good friend, Max Hastings, and they're very, very good, old, old mates. They're competitive with one another, but they're, they're old, old friends. Um, yeah. has written a review for the New York Times, which in itself is really, really not on. Because whenever I've written reviews for the, the um, New York Times, um, uh, review of books, which I have to say has only been about twice, I've had to sign away my life and say that I haven't any connection with anybody. I don't know these people. I've got nothing that would bias or influence my review, blah, 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 blah. And actually, the same yeah. for the Wall Street Journal. And actually, the Wall Street Journal recently asked me to review Max's book on, on the Dams Raid. And I said to them, yeah. I, I will do so, but I just want you to know that I do know Max. I mean, I, you know, I don't know him very yeah. well, but I do know him. And they went, will that influence your, um, your review? And I went, nope. And uh, they went, OK, fine. But there are checks. So the idea that, that Max is writing a balanced and objective view of Anthony's book is really... <laughs> and, and it shouldn't be a back-scratching exercise. And it, and it, and it is. Uh, and you see this time and time again in reviews in in books, in newspapers, of, of books in newspapers. Private Eye always very hit hot on this at Christmas, aren't they? Where they do the thing where everyone recommends each other's books. Yeah, it's just to, nauseating. And they, they lay it out it's where everyone nauseating. just recommends each other's I books. I just yeah, yeah, can't yeah. bear it. But anyway... Um, yeah. so, that, so that in itself is a bit naughty, but it's kind of fine. But the big thing is, is that Max completely slags off the British soldier of World War Two and just says, this is it. Yeah. It proves it once and for all that the British were crap and the Germans are really good. Well, let me read. Let me read the first two sentences, because because actually I, I got I got sent it. <laughs> what do you think about this? Exactly. Yeah, the same exactly. Thing. The same. Yeah. And 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 I and I read the first two sentences and then I put it down on Sunday to not. I thought I'm not reading. I'm not going to read this because it's just going to. It's just going <laughs> to. Not you too. And then I and then ten minutes ten minutes before we we set this Zoom up, I went. I thought oh, I bet I'm going to have to read it, aren't I? They were better. First sentence. They were better. Second sentence. Man for man, German soldiers fought more effectively in World War Two than their Allied counterparts did. Right. And, and and then it and then it goes on to you know and this is illustrated no more clearly than at Arnhem. Now the thing is, the thing with that is, is, <laughs> it, uh, uh, and and again I, I'm I'm plugging next Thursday, not this Thursday because that's Philippe Sands again, but the Thursday afters podcast with David Edgerton. We talk about we talk about Britain's war machine with him, and he says the problem is you what you have here is an explanation for something, and it's explaining something that didn't happen. <laughs> the, the, the 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 explanation that's been taken on life. Is, is explaining something that isn't what occurred. So you've got two things wrong in the... Pa and, and I've always felt... And I remember I remember when I went to the Borgi Boo Ridge, the first time, first time I went there when I was an adult, not with my dad, when we got lost around there in the car and he uh, bowled me out for bad map reading. Um, <laughs> we, we got to the top of the Bor Borgi Boo Ridge and I was interviewing a guy from the um, tank regiment and he said... And we didn't use it in the programme because my producer said, oh, God, we can't use it. He goes, oh, the likes of Max Hastings says we were useless soldiers. In that case, in that case, how did we get to the top of this fucking ridge? <laughs> like, well, well, they were better than us, but we still got up here. And, you, and he goes, you look at it. Look all the way down there. They can see it's coming miles off. You're like, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it's amazing. How, you know. And it, and it's just this it's just this thing um, that um, well also the other problem is is, anyway. is, is, is what, what he's saying is man for man he's not saying organisation for organisation he's saying man for man and that that is just simply bollocks because it depends yeah which man which unit when where what stage yeah. of the war a whole yeah. host of factors but if you're going man for man as an average as a mean over the whole six nearly six years of war. I just think that's absolute nonsense, uh, utter nonsense. Yeah. I mean, you also got to say, accept, and this is not kind of, I'm, I'm really not trying to sound jingoistic here, but 
no one, no army in the Second World War makes more ground for the less for for a loss of fewer lives than the British Army. That's surely your metric. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty good metric, isn't it? And if it, and if that yeah. is your metric, then that makes that man for man, the British Army are considerably better than the Germans, whose war dead is around nine million. You know, and yeah. and. and it's just it's just an absolute nonsense. And the idea that that I mean, and don't forget, this is a book about Arnhem. So the idea yeah, yeah. that the, the British paratroopers at Arnhem are be- are worse man for man than the Germans they're coming yeah. up against at Arnhem is just absolute nonsense. Well, it's because of the after, order. after all, they're being airborne soldiers is asymmetric. So you've got you've got um, armoured vehicles against blokes who can't deploy armour. And they right. they last nine days. Um, but it also uh, it's it's also the wrong metric because it shouldn't it's not man for man it's army against army with all that goes with it all that long tail and yes dare I say it, the operational level I mean it, it really is all yes! that stuff you know it is it's that big yeah, yeah. picture stuff that is what is missing from the narrative of those books is is and I've said yeah. it before but let's just stress it again what they do is they focus incredibly heavily on the strategic level. And the tactical level uh, and their sympathies yeah. and particularly Max's lies very firmly with the poor bastards that have to do the fighting at the bottom or the civilians who are being caught up in this maelstrom. Yeah. And there yeah. is a real yeah. visceral anger from him at the commanders and the fact that so many people lost their lives. But that being so, then he should be praising the British because they're far more careful of people's lives than everybody else's. I mean, OK, yeah, not Arthur Harris, perhaps. But why is Arthur Harris doing what they're doing? They're doing it to limit the number of lives lost of your own side. And, and the job yes, of your big, war big leaders picture, yeah. is, is yeah. to win the war as comprehensively and quickly as you possibly can for the fewest amount of deaths and casualties on your of your own people. And the British do that pretty efficiently. And actually, the Americans do it pretty efficiently as well, although the, the Americans are more gung-ho, not as careful with men's lives as the British are, all tied up with the fact that they haven't lost an entire generation in the in the First World War. Um, there's also yeah. kind yeah, of, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. there's exceptions to that, like Patton, who's a sort of, you know, he's a bit vainglorious. And is, I mean, it's really interesting. I think the Third Army has the highest casualties of any um, any Allied yeah. army in the, in the Second World War. Uh, and it's commanded by Patton. But, you know, it, it, it's all tied up with this whole idea of sort of, you know, British sort of stopping for tea and sort of, sorry, old chap, can't do it tonight, you know, because we've run out of, you know, run out of daylight or, or you know, because I haven't had tiff in yet and all this kind of nonsense. Yeah. Um, but but there is a reason why we constantly reorganise our, our line when we come up to... Because what happens is, because we've worked out that the Germans are always counterattack, if you can't bulldoze your through way through immediately what you then do is wait for your the weight of your force to come up reorganize yeah, yeah. and then redeploy and, and that yeah. that is a very very sensible way of doing things and of course it does take a little bit more time on occasion but that is also because yeah. you've got the problems of trying to moving all that mechanization but it is well, mainly and, and because tanks... fighting an organized well-prepared properly deployed um, battle basically means you're then deploying your firepower and it is the firepower that attrits and grinds down the Germans and makes sure you win and yeah. obviously what you don't want yeah. to do and this is a really strict policy of the British is once you've taken ground you don't lose it and the last time we do that is in North Africa and, and that is the point when they go back to the Alamein line and Alexander takes over as commander in chief of the Middle East and, and Monty comes over as 8th army and they go there will be no more reverse verses and that is it and they, yeah. and they the only other time where they lose ground and, and they do so deliberately, of course, is with Slim and 14th Army around in file. But otherwise, yeah. and th- that is a quite deliberately po- deliberate policy to grind down the Japanese 15th Army. But but otherwise, the policy is is to take land, hold on to it, not take it, and then lose 20 kilometres. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the first two sentences of this review, right? This is our review of the first two sentences of this review. <laughs> Basically, we haven't got into the we haven't got into the. Into the I have spent it. the whole I mean, the, morning with my fingers hovering over the two column on my inbox, saying to yeah. hovering about whether I email Max and go, "Well, mate, that was." I mean, the order. thing is, the, the, I mean, the thing is, is uh, and after all, the famous thing about the tanks are stopping for tea, and Major Julian Cook saying, oh, there wasn't enough aggression, and then Dick Winters saying they weren't aggressive. And, you know, by the time Lord Carrington, I mean, the the yet-to-be Lord Carrington, gets across Nymagen Bridge, I mean, days later than he ought to have done, for various reasons, the the one reason, I mean, 
he's there's, he's just got four tanks, so he can't. He hasn't got his FOOs. He hasn't got. Hasn't um, got infantry. Inf- prop- he hasn't got coordinated infantry support. He's got American infantry support in the form of the 101st, but but not not the people he should be moving forward and and all that. And what they're not, and like you say that and and the lights failing and tanks at night is a bad is is a bad thing against the against the Germans who are very expert at infiltrating against tanks. So you know it's I mean anyway. Anyway, that's that's the first two sentences of that review. We'll do the next two sentences in our following podcast. Right, we have. Oh, um... It's really, really got my goat. I've I've been feeling irritated by it all morning. I've got to say, it's really, <laughs> really, really annoyed Excellent. me. Excellent. Right. He's well, a nice chap, though, Max. I'll give him that. He's a really nice. No, guy. I don't. Well, the thing is, I don't <laughs> doubt it, and I've always, uh, you know, uh, um, it's just, I mean, Normandy, Normandy. His book about Normandy, you know, is, I remember reading that in a pair with Carlo Deste. And you just think this doesn't explain anything. But it's you also know, going back to all the. Shit. Do you, I mean, have you have you read the Slam Marshall stuff that was written just after the war, where he worked out yeah. I and mean, the whole thing that they're kind of sort of they're, that you know that uh, yeah, Germany is worth four yeah. times one. This was mm. done by completely bogus analysis of bogus statistics, um, and has you know in academic circles is just kicked into touch such a long time ago. I mean, it, it's absolutely yeah. old news, and yet it's the stuff that uh, on which. You know, a lot of people have written their written their books. Carlo Desti and Max, you know, being but two. Well, anyway, lots of correspondence from you in recent weeks. It's almost as if half the nation were trapped at home, twiddling their thumbs, watching war movies or listening to Second World War <laughs> podcasts. 